All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe so you can find out when all the cool guests are coming up. And maybe you think you can ask better questions of the guests than I can. What you got to do is go to the description, click on the Patreon link, pick the appropriate tier, and you can be uh, asking the questions next. And also seeing some of these interviews sometimes two weeks before anybody else. We've got a great guest today. I'm a big fan, and uh, he has a brand new book out. I've read it. We're going to talk about it. After playing 9,000 shows and selling over 20 million records, he's the founding member of Twisted Sister, and his new book, Twisted Business, Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll, is going to be available on September 21st. You can pre-order it right now. We're going to talk about that and more right after this. All right, please welcome JJ French. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, JJ. So before we get too into it, I want to make sure that I explain a little bit of my uh, history and interest in Twisted Sister. We had I've had Eddie Ojeda on, and I have a band here that I created called Sin City Sinners in Las Vegas. And we've had Eddie and we had the late AJ Perro out. Uh, and so I got to know the guys. I've seen Twisted Sister a ton of times. I was the perfect age to become a Twisted Sister fan. Uh, I didn't want to take it. I wanted to rock. My mother got me the Stay Hungry cassette. She put it in my uh, Christmas stocking. I've been an SMF ever since. I then found out there was two records before that. And then my life was uh, dedicated to Twisted Sister. So it is a, a real honor to have you here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And so we're really talking about this, which I happen to have right here a hard copy book. And I'll tell you, I've been reading more books since having the show. And obviously this one was something I was looking forward to. And what I like about this book is it's not just an autobiography. And so for people who want to, well, it's your autobiography, but it's not just a Twisted Sister book. If people want to know the history of Twisted Sister, there's an amazing documentary that people can check out. This is your life. This is your business experiences. This is your business uh, method. And then on top of it, there's some really great Twisted Sister facts. Usually when I do these interviews, I show each record cover and I have the artist discuss it. Well, we don't have to do that because in this book, JJ shows every Twisted Sister cover and gives you some history of it. So the first question that I ask anyone who has a book is, what made you decide to write this book? Well, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, you know, I got into the business of uh, motivational speaking several years ago. And um, when you get into that world, the first thing you're asked is, where's your book? That's the first thing someone asks. And while uh, I compiled an enormous amount of information and stories and history, I had never put put it down in, in print, you know. And um, so my co-author, Steve Farber, is a is a professional uh, motivational speaker, business speaker. I had seen him speak. We became friends. He encouraged me to get into the business of of speaking, and I started being booked by corporations, not by musicians, but by actually straight corporations, uh, business financial planners, travel agencies, bankers, crazy stuff. And I realized they loved hearing my stories. But again, the question came back as. Where's your book? Where's your book? Where's your book? And so Steve and I sat down. I said, I want to write a book that's great, that's accessible. And I want a professional writer to write with me, even though I'm a professional writer and I write for several magazines. I needed someone to help. You know, there's so much information out there. There's so many years worth of information. You need someone to edit it out and to go, this is important, this is important, this is important. So we, I coined this phrase called Bizwar. It's a business book and a memoir. So it's my story and my past which infused and imbued my history, my, my theories of, of business. And the book ultimately is about reinvention and the tools you need to reinvent. And these days with COVID, especially who doesn't need to reinvent. So that is the premise of the book. It's a biz war, a business book and a memoir. I coined that phrase like rom-com and um, hopefully the twisted method that I discuss in the book, people will understand and, and, and adapt or adopt because they are tools to actually help you in business. 
There's no question. And uh, what JJ is telling you is he's divided it up to, using the word twisted. Each letter stands for something that is something that you can use in your practical life, not just music a, a career, but in your life. And I think that it's a different approach. And I think that you you break the book up pretty good. Like it, it one second, you'll be talking about something that happened to you. Next second is the advice. Then you'll get some twisted sister and then you'll get some advice and it flows. Yeah, it's important that it flows and there's a lot to unpack in it. So it could have gotten confusing very early on, which is why I needed a professional editor and I needed a great book company like Rosetta who understood my vision. Because how many of these books are the same old story, you know, rock autobiographies, you know, you struggle, blah, 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 and then you make it, then you're a drug addict, then you lose everything. And then, you know, somebody in your band dies and then everything goes to hell. And then maybe you come back and maybe you reform, maybe you reunite, maybe you don't. But it's the same story that you see in behind the musics over and over and over again. And I think what makes Twisted Sister so unusual is our documentary was not that. That. It was a completely different approach to the documentary. It was to educate people as to what it took to actually make it. And the documentary ended right. before Stay Hungry even came out. Right. And my book is not this tell all sleaze bag, nonsensical uh, piece of literature that's scandal mongering. What my book is like, hey, man, I had a crazy life, a really crazy life, a life that most people have no idea. And I lived through this crazy life only to join a band of transvestites. I mean, before Twisted came around, um, I already I was a drug dealer and a drug addict for years. And, and my reputation as, as being so straight is my reaction to being all those things made me so straight that nobody wanted to deal with me because I was like so adamantly straight. And that's what the beauty of having D and the beauty of having Mark Mendoza is they shared that. Uh, that vision with me, which is there's a lot of work to do. And now here's a th question. You go to the end of the book and I list all the shows because people go, really, how many shows did you play? Were you blown away when you saw that list? I was blown away and I'm glad you brought this up because I think you undercounted because I, there's- I, I actually did think I undercounted. because two you played, shows yeah. that I was at yeah. here in Las Vegas at the Silverton. And this was to be sort of the, the beginning of the next comeback, April yeah. 9th, 2005. And then you came back the following year and the theater was closed. You guys had a play out by the pool, April 29th, 2006. So we're, we're estimating 9,000 shows, but who knows how many more there are. I, I figure we missed as many as I could log in. I figure I missed about 150 mm -hmm. more uh, because there was so much and so much history. And I kept going back to my agents and going back to, you sure you got it? You sure you got it? But, you know, I knew we were going to miss some. I knew we were going to miss some, but the over, but what people need to understand is that when bands today claim that they've played a lot of shows and you ask them, how many is that? And they go, we play twice a month. And that's a lot in my day at the risk of sounding like my dad, like, you know, when we were young, you know, gasoline was four cents a gallon. The fact is, is that you played five shows a night, six nights a week. So that means the first three years that Twisted existed, I had already hit 3,000 performances at that point. Yes. So, you know, so, uh, and people just don't look, understand. Look at some of these pages for the people at home. This is, and you remember, this is a band that took at least 12 years off. So yeah. when yeah. you look at some of these New York dates, 6'1", 6'3", 6'4", 6'8", 6'10", 6'11", 6'17", 18", 19", that's in Wontog, New York. I mean, this is insane. And I don't think the, the average fan knows that how much work you guys put into it. Yeah. Um, so hopefully the book illustrates. illustrates. Now, why I have so many performances added up is because I read a book about the Who years ago. And they were talking about their performances. And they said, well, in 1967, we played 45 shows in nine days. And I went, how did they do that? Well, I was at one of those shows. It was the Murray the K Easter show. And it was um, it was a uh, a review. So Cream and the Who were the opening bands. Okay, they were the opening bands. The headliners were Mitch Ryder, the Detroit Wheels, Wilson Pickett, and the Young Rascals were the headliners. But on this bill, there was ten acts, and each act played two songs, and each act did this five times a day for nine days. Think about that. And a ninety-minute review, 
10, 10 groups came and went and came and went and came and went. So when I saw Cream, they played two songs. And I saw The Who, they played two songs. But The Who were claiming, well, we did 45 performances because we did nine days, five shows a day. And I'm thinking to myself, well, a performance is a performance, whether it's one day at a television studio or it's an hour show. or So I said, damn, you know what? We played a hell of a lot of shows. And that preceded Dee's involvement even because Dee didn't come in till three years later. At that point, I had already hit the 3000 performance mark, you know, which is Incredible. Yeah. insane, insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the book definitely um, illustrates your humble beginnings. I'm a New Yorker originally. One of the things that I take away that's most fascinating is you have lived in the same apartment and you've had that apartment for 60 years. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm talking to you from that apartment. <laughs> right. Yeah, now. That's like I'm good. talking to you from the bedroom that I grew up in. <laughs> which is which is amazing. You're on the Upper West Side. I went to school in Spanish Harlem. You're, you're you know you're not too far away, and uh, the neighborhood has obviously come a long way. And the the the, the uh, prices to live in that building uh, have come a long way. I found it fascinating that you were on the tenants turned to you at one point to be on the board to to go and help. Wipe. I'm sure they were trying to get people out. Well, actually, I was in the tenants. My mother was in the tenants association in the '60s. I was in it in the 80s and became the president in 2012 mm -hmm. of the Tenants Association when the building was converting to condos. And we had a fight against the evil sponsors and the uh, at the um, environmental hazards that were brought about. But let's just say it was it all worked itself out at the end. But I, I am a product of my neighborhood and I've been here all my life. So I know this really well. In fact, in fact, when we moved here, to put this in context for people, and maybe we'll understand it or not, West Side Story was being shot in the year wow. we moved in. <laughs> okay. Incredible. So there was still they were filming exteriors. If you watch West Side Story in the beginning, when the Jets and the Sharks are all fighting each other and they're throwing right. vegetables at each other on a hill, that is Lincoln Center being built at the time. That's actually on the lot of Lincoln Center as it was being built. So. Um, and also, most of the yard sequences, the gang sequences, were not filmed on the west side. They were filmed on the east side, <laughs> in the schoolyard on East 111th, I think. So, yeah, I've actually been to the schoolyard up before because I went. I went to school right, not too far from there. Uh, yeah, like years later. But it's so yeah. funny, and yeah, and so people who don't understand, in New York, they, there is rent control, but it is very hard to hold an apartment, and they are looking mm -hmm. to get people out to make money. So to say that you're in the same place, because uh, I've seen you speak with Dee Snyder about it on one of his podcasts. This is the same place that you guys were smoking pot on the roof and, yeah. and meeting when you were kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I took so much drugs on the roof of my building. The fact that I didn't fall off is, is crazy. So yeah, it's a, you know, it is, it is a, um, the, the story spans a long period of time. And I think it spans an exciting period of time. The 60s were special. Well, yeah, and and the way you tell the stories, I think people can fit being there. And so you're getting into management. You, 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 I don't think you even know that you're necessarily in getting into management. You're just doing your thing. One of the great stories, you're at Electric Lady Land, the famous studio built by Jimi Hendrix. And you're essentially having a mob hit put on you. <laughs> yeah, well, there was a, a, a misunderstanding Mm -hmm. among certain parties as to the intention of certain songs being manipulated and used. And I didn't understand at the time what the, <laughs> I didn't understand the ramifications. And uh, and uh, the owner of the studio basically threatened me with having my legs broken. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, also, if you read the book by Tommy James, Me, The Music and the Mob, or any bands that, that came through the New York scene in the 60s, there's an under belly of mob interference and involvement, you know, to be clear. And I want to be really clear. No guy ever walked up to me and said, I'm a mobster. Mm -hmm. No guy ever walked up to me and said, I just killed somehow somebody. Nobody ever said anything obvious to me, but if you had any brains at all and you listen to the conversations that were taking place in the atmospheres that, uh, of this business that we were in, you knew damn well what was going on. And so you didn't have to ask. You just kind of had to observe, you know, and so you kind of mind your own business and you look away. Um, but there was all that there was that vibe. But that vibe was common to thousands of bands. It wasn't just common to me. 
You know, it just it was out there. I mean, the, the the weirdest thing for me was there was a club once out uh, out on Long Island that we played, and um, the first time we drove out to the club, we were told that the partner, one of the partners of the owner, had just been found dead in a boating accident, and that it was possibly murder by one of the partners. And by mind you, this is the first day out. Like we're driving to this venue. We're going to play this club for the first time. It's a huge, huge room. And the first thing we hear when we get there is that potentially some partner died. And the question was, was he murdered? And, you know, so like, welcome. Hey, so what time are you guys doing your sound check? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you know, there's a club in Jersey called the Satellite Lounge. Very famous club. And um, and this is a true story. The owner of the club told Fog had to shoot down and uh, to turn down their volume. And they didn't. He pulled out his gun and shot their martial amps. Up. And that's uh, that's well known. I mean, that's kind of been written in a lot of books. Yeah. About the night that that the night that Foghat got their amps shot up, and that guy, the guy who's purportedly did it, purportedly, I mean, you know who knows. Allegedly. Guy, allegedly, purportedly, that guy threatened me too. He threatened the band. You know, like we were too loud. You know, you guys don't turn down. There's going to be problems. You know, you hear this stuff all the time. The funniest story I ever heard was before I joined Twisted Sister, the group that was Twisted, which was Silver Star, which was called Stud six months prior to Silver Star, they told me a story in which they were playing a club in Jersey City. And, you know, these clubs were owned by, you know, sketchy characters. Yeah. And normally you're always too loud. You know, they don't want to, you know, these guys came from the era of Sinatra and, you know, Tony Bennett and stuff like that. And they're forced to deal with rock bands. And allegedly they were roughing a guy up in the alleyway and they told the band for the next 15 minutes, you could play as loud as you, you know, play as loud as you want, you know, like do, do us a favor and cover up the screen. So that was that was the first story I heard. Like when I when I auditioned for the band, we I heard that yeah, some guys told us to turn up because they were taking care of somebody. So you know that was just the atmosphere at the time. Look, it's funny in a way. It's kind of funny. You survived. That makes it a little funnier. You, you so you survived it, and you see, and our truck got blown up, which I talk about in the book. Yes. You know, uh, uh, a, so purportedly. A, a club owner was angry that we didn't replay his. We didn't go back to his room, and so he purportedly sent a, fa a relative in to, to destroy our truck. And he burned it down on a night where there was uh, 2,000 people in the room. It was a Friday night. And uh, I was playing Sweet Jane. The band was playing Sweet Jane. And someone said, your truck is on fire. Opened up the side door. And our truck, our brand new truck, was in 55 50 foot flames. And the flames were so hot, it melted another truck. That was owned by a band called Rat Race Choir that broke down the night before. So their truck is destroyed. My truck is destroyed. I don't even know what's going on. This was really early on. Uh, and I was stunned. And we told everybody at the club, you must leave now. Please leave. Go out the front door because if this truck blows up with the gas and gasoline, it'll take the wall down. I wanted to clear the club. We, we cleared the club out. And I, I walk out into the parking lot and I'm wearing hot pants. Mm -hmm. Six inch heels, a little leather top. It's in the middle of January. And I don't care because I'm so shocked that our truck had just been blown up or set on fire. Then I was standing there staring at the tr the flames and the, the fire department comes in and some kid walks up to me and he says, hey, man, you going on stage to finish Sweet Jane? <laughs> and I said, what? Yeah, I paid five dollars. I only have Sweet Jane. I'm like, do you see what's happening to my truck? My truck is on fire. I ain't finishing the fucking song. <laughs> it's amazing. JJ, in those days, those early days, did you go collect the money? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. probably did that for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's what you do at the end of the night. There's a... I tour managed for a band that was on Atlantic Records, a very famous band, and they had different lineups. And one night, the the promoter or the owner of the club decided that they didn't like the lineup of that band that we put on and they cursed me out and paid us in singles, you know, 20,000 singles. And so I can only imagine when you're starting out, you know, you're not, we're not going to take, it's not there yet. How difficult it must've been after the show or before the show to try to collect. Well, it wasn't hard to collect. It was, it was because we weren't getting paid very much money in the early days, you know. But I can tell you, I can tell you one instance where we made $37.50 playing one night and my agent came down to take his $3.70 commission. <laughs> and I will never forget 
that he came down, our, our agent's partner came down and he said, I, I need the commission. I said, that's $3 and 70 cents. And he goes, yeah, you made 37 50. I want my $3 and 70 cents. And I was like, Whoa. Okay. That's fucked up. He <laughs> left his house to come get that. <laughs> you Probably know. spend more in gas than, than, you know, that, you know, I mean, one night, with bikers came in, were harassing the band, and 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 D made some comment, and and someone hit him in the head with a bottle cap, and he called out. He didn't know who was in the club. He called out the bikers, you know. But he didn't know there were bikers. He didn't know anything. Sure. And the next thing you know, these bikers come in, you know, and they go uh, play. We did. We ended with "Born to Be Wild," which seems to just calm everybody down, you know. And they came in and they said, do it again for the Jersey chapter. So we gladly went up and did it again. And then we finished and they came back and they said, do it again for the Connecticut chapter. And we gladly went up and did it for the Connecticut chapter. We didn't want any problems. Um, but also the next day, the club owner was so intimidated that the bikers came that he came with a loaded gun. And when I walked into Soundcheck, he put the loaded rifle right on the bar. And he said, if they come back tonight, I got this. And I said to my, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm really... I got into this business to play rock and roll. I didn't get into this business to get murdered. And yet we were confronted periodically with situations that involved firearms, which I go into in the book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there, there's no shortage. What's amazing is that people who discovered Twisted Sister through MTV and, and this very bright image could never have understood the dues that were paid. I don't think it's so maybe the documentary people really understood and what that scene was like. And again, the book shows it though. It shows the triumphs over these crazy situations and it outlines the endurance because Twisted Sister is an endurance test. And especially on you who's managing it and trying to keep it going and trying to keep it going when no one else wants to anymore. The stories about you keeping the trademark are, are really interesting because you were saying, I'm broke. I, I'm filing for bankruptcy. They want the name. But you're saying, you know what, I, I think that one day this name could be worth something again. And what I great story in the book is that D came to you to try and buy the name. Yeah, early, early. Yeah, D came to me after the breakup and he wanted to buy the name and I hated him so much. It, it was so nasty. I looked at him and I said, I'd rather eat dog food out of a toilet bowl in Times Square and they'll allow you to have the name. That's how I felt, you know. And I wasn't trying to screw anyone else. I only maintained the ownership because I wanted to be able to maintain credibility with the band. How many bands have no credibility any longer because the brother's cousin's nephew is the drummer and the, you know, and there's nothing. I wanted people to know that when they got Twisted Sister, no matter when they ever get it, they're getting Twisted Sister. They're getting a real band. They're not getting some cover band. They're not getting some fake band. They're not getting a, 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 a manipulated uh, misdirection of a band. They were getting the real thing. And I thought I would be the, the protector of that. And so I said to Dean, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it to you. And then, and then, or, or license it to you. And then what happened was uh, within two years, D and I were both sued for a million dollars and we both, we weren't talking, but we were both filed for bankruptcy. So here I am in 1984 walking around the streets was like, you know, Oh my God, like we're one of the biggest bands in the world. And in 1988, or 80, no, I think it was 90. I had to file for bankruptcy. And I walked out of bankruptcy court downtown and it was a humbling experience because I had no money. I had nothing left. And um, and my my stepmother gave me a credit card and a friend of mine gave me a job working at a pool hall overnight. And he was a former detective who who had bought a, who bought a pool hall. There was a pool hall thing in New York City on the Upper West Side in the early 90s. David Brenner had a pool hall. Like It was very hip to have a pool hall. And he bought this beautiful pool hall. And he said to me, um, I'll give you a job and work overnights. But he knew that I was you know, self-conscious about the fact that I was broke. And I didn't want to be perceived as being broke. So he said to me, you could tell anyone who asks you why you're here that you're an owner. To oh. save face, right? So I'd be hanging out at the pool hall at night, and um, and if anyone did ask me, I'd say, oh, I'm a part owner. And that was fine. That saved face for a while. So, And then what we did was the guy who bought that pool hall and me had a business together, and we managed his nephew, and his nephew got a really big record deal, and that was one of the attempts to come back as a manager. The book, however, uh, 
takes people through what is known as the twisted method of reinvention. That's T-W-I-S-T-E-D. And, and each letter means something. And in the book, I explain why it means something. So it's T is tenacity. Go figure. W is wisdom, because without it, you don't go anywhere. I is inspiration, because without inspiration in the early days, you got nothing. Then there's trust, excellence, and discipline. It's it's And those are the things that made it. It wasn't sex, drugs, rock and roll, and fairy dust and making a deal with the devil, which is what most people somehow think happens to all these bands. I also can't say that Molly Crew or Aerosmith or Judas Priest or ACDC you know, didn't follow kinds of trajectories that way. I'm sure there were business minds behind them. Because how many musicians do we know who have no business sense fail? Right. Most of them fail. So either you are self-managed, and have a vision, um, or you get somebody who can manage you with a vision. With Kiss's case, Gene and Paul were always business people. Right. They fully understood the business. And although they had other managers, they understood the business. So Gene can get you know all kinds of nonsense about oh, all you do is talk business. Maybe people are sick of hearing that you throw that in their face all the time. I can see that there's a certain arrogance that may repulse some people, but he was a smart guy. He and, told uh, you your name. He told you your name was too Jewish. Yes, he did tell me my name was too Jewish. It was the it was the first in the book. I tell the story. He's the first person who ever told me I'm too Jewish, and and that was by a Jew. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd think it would be some you know some anti-Semitic guy who goes, "Hey Jew, no, a Jew told me I'm too Jewish," and I never thought of myself as Jewish. I was the I just thought of myself as a New York kid, right? Because all my friends in New York City. If you grow up in New York City, you grow up in a really mixed area. And your friends are all Puerto Rican and black, and everyone is everything. And no one talks religion. No one could care less. You know, it's either getting high or you're not getting high. You either love the Beatles or you don't love the Beatles. It's all that mattered was the music that we listened to and whether we got high enough or we dealt drugs together. Nobody cared about anything else. We wanted to get laid. Your original, yeah, your original drummer is black. Uh, Eddie Elheda is Puerto Rican. So it shows that. Yeah, I mean, it didn't, it didn't matter, but. Um, G Gene, when I auditioned for Kiss, you know, first thing he said to me, you got to change your name. It's too Jewish. I was like, what? I hadn't occurred to me. And then he goes, take your glasses off. You, you, you look too Jewish. I, well, how does a Jew look? You know, I don't, you know, it's a weird thing for a Jew to say that to another Jew, except that, you know, that's what the studio heads did in Hollywood for years. They tried to remove your ethnic connection, not just being Jewish. It didn't matter. It was just anything. They gave you these plain Jane names. Because they didn't want you to turn off people in the Midwest, and and I and Gene explained to me that he was renaming himself because they uh, Gene Simmons because he was a fan of Kim Simmons, the guitar player for um, Status Quo, not Status Quo. Um, oh God, which man? Um, Savoy Brown, I think. And and this he said that Stanley Eisen's changing his name to Paul Stanley, and I said, so you're anglicizing the names to emulate your English rock band, okay? That sounds plausible to me. You know, they had the vision of playing through Marshall amplifiers. Did you know that back in the early 70s, no American acts played Marshall? Yeah, Except, I, I thought about it after reading your book, yeah. yeah. Except Jimi Hendrix did, and, and Blue Cheer did, but every other band was playing Fenders and Voxes and music bands, but the British bands all played Stacks, you know, High Watts, Marshalls. Bowie played Sims Watts, which are a rare version of it, a rare version of a stack. Um, Sound City, you know, boxes, big boxes, big, heavy boxes. That's what British bands played. We played Fenders, you know, little like dinky things. And Kiss kind of, their vision, I think, was heavy. So when I saw them at the loft playing their songs, Kissified, it was, wow. They have an idea of what they're doing, as opposed to the New York Dolls, who we would all go see every week at the, at the Mercer Arts Center, and they were, you know, terrible. They were just like, if they didn't look the way they did, they'd be laughed out of the room. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. The Dolls looked amazing. Let me put this out there for you Dolls fans. They looked amazing, okay? I was at the Mercer Arts Center every week to sit there and watch them look amazing and to sit there and go, why do they have to suck so bad when you look like this? As opposed to yeah. David Bowie, that looked amazing, but had a band that was fucking amazing. So I luckily saw the Spiders yeah. with Mick Ronson, who became a hero of mine. 
you know, I went, oh, my God, that is a rock god for me. Were you one of those guys who saw the dolls like Johnny Ramone and said, well, I could do that? No, because I was pissed. I mean, remember, this is this is in September 72. So I had auditioned for Kiss in June, didn't get the gig, joined an Allman Brothers cover band wow. in the, the, the summer of 72, lived in a hippie commune in New Jersey or in Pennsylvania. We played only one show, but the guys in that band were phenomenal musicians. The singer was great. The guitar player was great. These are great players. You know, kids, guys who played the bars were great players. You can't suck playing bars. You got to be good. Dolls didn't grow up through that. You know, so here's the thing with the dolls. If you are my age, and you'll understand this, so I'm going to, I'm 69 years old. So I'm 17, 18, 19 years old. I'm going to the Fillmore every week. Yeah. And at the Fillmore every week, I'm seeing Jeff Beck, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, The Dead, The Airplane, um, uh, 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 Can't Heat, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, um, Taj Mahal, John Mayall, Rod Stewart, the list goes on and on and on every week, $3. And if you couldn't afford it, you paid a dollar at Central Park to see the same acts in Central Park during the summer for $1, $1. So Jimi Hendrix, Chambers Brothers, $1. Led Zeppelin, one dollar okay so we have three or four years of the excellence of the greatest rock acts ever to come through new york okay ends in 71 Fillmore closes and when the dolls played in 72 i'm looking at this thing and going this is what the evolution of the film war led to <laughs> this shit like these guys can't play I knew them. I hung out. They used to they used to rehearse at a place called Talent Recon. Most people for, don't even know what that is. Before SIR existed, Talent Recon existed. It was run by a guy named Satan because he looked just like Satan. He looked just like the devil. He'd sit on a desk. And I used to rehearse with my Allman Brothers cover band in one room, and the dolls would rehearse. And I'd hear him, and I knew Johnny Thunders from the park, and everybody knew he wasn't a player. Like, you know, he, was, he looked really cool with the guitar. Flat out looked cool. But they really couldn't play. So when I went to see them, I was like, okay, you know, they look great. And that the idea was put up, come up with a band that looks that good that can actually play. You know, this is a blasphemous statement to make to Dolls fans, like blasphemous. Oh, I, but, I can just see the Dolls fans uh, uh, typing but, now. <laughs> but let me explain, though. The Ramones were great. The difference in the Ramones and the Dolls the Ramones actually had an ad, had a really tunnel vision attitude about what they wanted to do. So when I saw the Ramones in 75 at CBGB's on a Sunday evening at about 7 o'clock and there was nobody in the room and the PA system was on tables, so we're talking really early on, Joey was wearing a, a Jaws T-shirt and they just breezed through the first record. You know, they just played all that shit. And I'm like... You know, okay, they're very simple, but they're really good. Like, they really know who they are. And they played perfectly for what they were. So, um, you know, you can kill me for thinking the dolls weren't great, except that David Johansson has gone on record saying they suck, so I don't really have to say it. You know, he said it a million times. He said it a million times. And by the way, to give the dolls their credit, and I will give them this credit, they did play one night at the reopened Fillmore East in December of 72, at a show produced, ironically, by Andy Horn, who did our documentary. And they were great that night. And now this was about the eighth or ninth time I'd seen them. And every time I go see the dolls, I keep hoping that they would be good because I thought, you can't look that good and suck that bad. And they were great that night. So it was, it was, it was um, Eric and the Magic Tramps and Teenage Lust and the Dolls. And the dolls were really, really good. But then I saw them a bunch more, and they weren't. And then they brought them out to the Hamptons to play against us in the summer of 73. And it was more probably the most pathetic show I have ever seen. I felt so bad for the band. They played a happy hour on a beach. Now, can you imagine the dolls playing a happy hour at a beach bar on the ocean, two in the afternoon, Right, in the daylight, to, yeah. To a bunch of kids who all they wanted to hear was smoke on the water, okay? It's all these kids wanted to hear. They wanted to hear smoke on the water, we're an American band, and, you know, Doobie Brothers. That's all these kids want to hear. 
you know, and we were grudgingly accepted because all the guys in my band were these blue collar guys who shared this mentality and we were a cover band. So we played Smoke on the Water and all this stuff as well as Bowie and Louie. So the dolls come out and they do personality crisis. And I remember sitting there watching them play catacornered on a little tiny stage in this beach bar at two o'clock in the afternoon. And they were booed off the stage. And, and you know why? They shouldn't have been there. Right. It was a bit, it was definitely a wrong booking. Yeah. It was the wrong booking. Yeah. It, it, you know, the dolls are, if you're going to love the dolls and you're going to come from New York, LA, Chicago, Miami, you know, in one of those dark bars, and you're going to be into the Rolling Stones, into the whole shtick, you know, of what they are, the representing of this rock and roll thing with, you know, this, you know, David Johansson and Johnny Thunders doing the Mick and Keith routine, kind of like Stevie, you know, kind of like what, um, uh, the guy, you know, Aris with Joe Perry and, you know, Steve. Yeah. So they do that, you know, Jagger Richard thing. And there's, and there's the dolls, except that their songs didn't work. And I actually felt horrible, horrible for them. They just shouldn't have never have done that. And the club owner only brought them out because we were out there. And he wanted it, you know, glitter, glitter. That's all yeah. I think we should have done. Glitter bands, man. We'll bring out the dolls. They got a record out, man. Yeah. You know? It's an it's an amazing history. It's also an amazing history that you uh, you have an amazing memory. The book shows it. I mean, these are the details you get into are so incredible. And uh, you know, and you describe it. You know, I can picture these things. One of the things I want to go back a little bit that we were talking about is th those tough years. And I talked to Eddie about this when when Twisted Sister breaks up after the Love Is for Suckers record. All these bands are coming out these warrants and these, you know, uh, uh, slaughters and, and no disrespect to any of these bands, but they're getting huge. And I'm thinking to myself, where is Twisted Sister? And you guys must, and I know you guys had a lot of issues, but you must have been thinking, this is our, we created a lot of this. This is our time. And that window didn't open. Well, I didn't think that myself. Uh, we, we screwed it up. It was our fault. We made some calculated look like, for all of the for all of the smart for all of my supposed smartness. Um, uh, I, I'll take credit for some good decisions, and I'll also say we blew we blew it too. You know, we blew it. So I didn't really turn around and think, "Oh my God, these guys are stealing our thunder." What I thought was, um, "What a shame! That was so much work. We blew it and couldn't keep it together long enough." But you know, it was a blessing in disguise. Because three years later, the grunge business came out and destroyed it all anyway. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, it was like the dinosaurs being wiped out by the meteor. Smells like Teen Spirit comes out and wipes out everybody. Now they're all out of work. I mean, they're all out of work. I mean, Vito brought his famous quote. He heard Smells Like Teen Spirit and stopped playing guitar. He just said, that's it. I'm done. Didn't pick up a guitar for nine months. Janie Lane said he was driving on the 405, heard Smells Like Teen Spirit. I think he said it. he pulled over and went, my life is over as I know it. It was like the freaking meteor killing the dinosaurs. So when that happened, I'm like kind of laughing, you know, like, ha, oh, well, we didn't get blown out by that, right? We didn't get scarred by that right? because we were gone. So we did not get scarred by the destruction of the hair metal thing as much as I hate that phrase. Oh, uh, yeah, I understand. And when we came back, we came back fully formed, same lineup in Europe and – just hopscotched over all that negative shit. Right. And if you look at the bands that succeed in Europe, very few American bands succeed in Europe. The Warrants don't succeed. The Rats don't succeed. You know, the 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 um, you know, the whole so SoCal, the Dawkins. You know, the, yeah, they show up once in a while, little little positions on these festivals, but nobody comes back like this. The only band that came back, the only two was Guns N' Roses, were able to kind of come back at that level. Metallica is not part of that era, right. so I'll put them to the side. Um, when Twisted Sister returned, we returned as headliners, royalty, and headlined the biggest shows in the world for the next 14 years. So when people say to me, you know, are you going to get back together again or blah, 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 I say I have nothing left to prove. Had the band not come back at the level that it came back at, I would still be here going, oh, man, we should go back. But, man, we, had the, you know, we did 125 shows reunited. Yes. From 2003 to to uh, to uh, to 2016, and we annihilated every every venue. We blew every venue apart. We were the best. I saw, band. 
I saw it six, seven times, so I, I, I can attest to that. Um, and it was, and you guys might have killed you, you killed each other if you stayed together during those years. You know, it might have there might not have been a reunion. One of the things that I love about the book, as I said, is in the back, you show pictures of the records and you talk about the records. I had Eddie on. I said to him, Bo Hill says that Red Beach played most of the guitar and Love is for Suckers. I worked with Winger and Red Beach told me he probably played a lot of the guitar. He said, one time I met JJ and he goes, you know what? I think a lot of that is you, not me. And Eddie got so mad. He got so mad. It was the first interview where I had to kind of censor things he was saying. He was mad at Bo Hill. And, but as you say in the book, Reb played a lot of that. Good yeah. I don't know if I'm on the record. I I never listened to the record. I, yeah. I, I, that's not true. I listened to it when the band reformed because we wanted to do one song from the record. Wake so we up did Wake Up. Time. Yeah, which is a great song. And by the way, there's some great songs on the record. But, I don't know if I'm on it, and I don't know. Uh, Eddie's on it, I'm sure. He's on it more than me, but I don't think I'm on it. You know, I told the, split, the story is that he split Eddie and Reb, and that the solos are divided. And so oh, they they may have been. I I really I don't have any recollection of it because the band was breaking up during the recording. The record D tried to fire me in the middle of the recording. He had a meeting, and he said. I think it's time for you to go. And he looked at Eddie and Eddie and, and, and I said, what do you think? And he goes, well, maybe D's right. And I looked at Eddie like, why? You, you know, you're my buddy. I brought you into this band. We were in high school together. High school. And Mendoza went, fuck you both. Like that ain't happening. And of course we were a four man band at that point. Cause Joe Franco was not a member. And I'm the only guy that fires people in the band. So, you know, I'm the executioner. <laughs> and I looked at it. I think I said, I'm the, I said, you can't execute the executioner. And uh, it was a Mexican standoff. And that was it. So we stayed together and then we played 13 shows and that was the end of it. And then D said he wanted to buy the name. And I was so pissed off at him that I said, I'd rather eat dog food. I even said something even worse than that. I think I said, no, I think, I think I said, if I was offered $10 million to reunite with you and I knew you were being paid a nickel, <laughs> In other words, I'm getting paid $10 million and you're getting a nickel. I won't do the show. You know? But look, to D's credit, and let's take the flip, flip this over. D and I reunited. We had a seriously great conversation, one of the heaviest conversations I ever had in my life. And this, uh, is, in my, this is outlined in the book, too. The yeah. first time you guys get back together, spend a day together, uh, it's, it's a, it, what a great story. Yeah, we're we are in my kitchen, and um, and it was because of this uh, album that uh, a triple platinum album that I had sent to his house because we had just gone triple platinum on Stay Hungry, and he didn't accept it. It wound up in my house, and I want I didn't know where to what to do with it. So through the, through a mutual friend, I got his phone number and left a message, and he called me. D called me. This was um, in '96, so we stopped talking in '88. So this is eight years later. And um, it turned out that the day D came to my apartment to have this confrontational clearing of the air was the 20th anniversary of his hiring. Hmm. So he was hired February 16th, I think, 1976. So there's all sorts of dates and anniversaries and sociological commonalities because the band's been together for almost 50 years. The reason why I remember most of the stuff I remember is because I attach them to larger issues, like bigger things. You know, like we, we played through two gas crises. Nobody understands what that's about. We played through two gas crises. We played through the Son of Sam murders. That was a year of hell because girls weren't coming to the clubs because they're afraid they're going to be killed by the Son of Sam. And we were taunting the Son of Sam the whole year. We're taunting him from the stage. Fuck you, man. You show up here, we're going to kick your ass. I'm thinking, you know, great. You know, maybe he'll show up. Turns out the day they arrested him, he was on his way out to the Hamptons to go out in a blaze of glory. We were the only band playing in the Hamptons that night. Wow. Who knows what would have who knows what would have happened? However, people don't know these stories. People don't know what a band goes through. You know, you go through 10 years of shit in these clubs, a lot of stuff happens. Like a lot of stuff happens. And 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 so I'm able to tell you those stories and have you go. Man, you still survived that shit, you know?
And it's 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 great the way you tell them. And also, like I said, I think a lot of people see uh, we're not going to take it for the first time, and that's their that oh this band just must have just made it. Um, and I want to read a little part of your book real quick. Okay. Uh, and this is a little bit of advice, and this gives you a little idea, and I think that people at home will dig this. My advice to you is this. Strive for excellence in yourself and others. Share what you know freely, because by helping others be better at what they do, you will rise up as well. Coach and advise the people you love just because you want to help them. If you take money out of the equation, it frees, up, uh, frees you up to be a true mentor. When I tell people I believe in, who I believe in, don't doubt for a minute how good you are. It makes me really happy to see them light up and rise to the occasion. This is the kind of motivational things that if you want to be in this business, you better be prepared for and to learn how to give back, which you have done. Your management career, Seven Dust, Seven Dust was an unknown band. You and Mark produced their record. You managed their career. And this sends you on your way. This is after Twisted Sister. You probably didn't know what was going to happen next. Yeah, that that's a whole you know that the, the book is is a very strongly motivationally uplifting book. I didn't get into the the sordid details of Seven Dust because the idea was not to get into the sordid details of a lot of things. Yes, you know, I mean, there, there were commonalities to many things. I will say this about Seven Dust, which I'm proud of. Twisted has now almost 50 year history, and Seven Dust has an almost 25 year history. Wow. Now, how long do bands normally stay together? Three years, five years. So the fact that we're almost at 50 and they're at 25 means that I, I kind of have a good idea of people who are going to last. And Seven Dust is an amazingly talented bunch of guys. And we, for, for a short period of time, we shine together as a company. And we made extraordinary um, successes. And I'm proud that the album that Mark and I produced was the, was the, was the biggest album so far that they did I'm, I'm proud of it and and they've gone on on their own way but yeah i mentor people now i don't manage artists officially and you know what's good about mentoring you give all the advice for free and i don't have to get the phone calls at 3 a.m <laughs> you know because you're well, not paying you know you're not paying me i have no responsibility but i will and my co-writer steve farber his that's how he writes his books he's a very uplifting person and he believes in love and he believes that that uh, that manifests positivity. So I don't want to go sounding like a Christian youth group here, but I will say that um, you reap what you sow. And if you go out there and you and you try to do the best you can all the time, uh, then you then you are at your best. And Twisted Sisters excellence, the excellence that we created um, really manifests itself from this. I believe there's four states of mind for a rock band. OK, and these are the four states of mind. One, on a given night, you suck and the audience sucks and you really just want to hang it up. You just go, you know what? This isn't for me. Then there's the nights where you're great and the audience sucks and you really don't understand how that happened, but you have to try to find out what happened. Then there's nights that you suck and the audience is great and you go, thank God I got away with murder because, man, we really suck tonight. And then there's you're great and the audience is great. And that's a 10. And we strove, if that is a correct word, we strived, strove, to be a 10 every night. We wanted to be as great as we could be and deliver a quasi-religious performance, meaning a unified uh, exhortation of glee and happiness. And that's what I believe we've done because uh, you said you've seen us on a number of occasions since the reunion. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, where did you see the band? I saw the Vegas shows. I directed the award show here that you guys performed at with Frankie Benali at that point. Right. Right. I saw the Hard Rock with uh, Portnoy. So seen it a bunch of times. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. I saw every night of the Christmas show. Yeah. Every ah, night. There you go. And how much fun was that? Amazing. And I was fortunate yeah. to be there front row. Uh, every as a kid, I didn't think I'd get to see Twisted Sister. I'm a little bit mm -hmm. younger. I thought that my favorite band was never going to be part of my life. And when those reunion shows happened, it was amazing. And to be able to go every night and see it, uh, the Christmas thing, an amazing reinvention as well. Uh, and it, which is one of those things, Twisted Sister D threatens to end it every year. But then there's just get the the brand becomes bigger and bigger and you just can't walk away from it. Yeah, and 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 look at the dedication. I don't think there's a better front man than Dee Snyder. I've said it a million times. 
I, I could love him, hate him, doesn't matter. I've stood shoulder to shoulder with him, thousands of shows. I know what he does. I know how he approaches his act. He does warm ups for two hours every night. Nobody does that. He doesn't mess around, you know. Um, Mendoza, AJ, I mean, the best rhythm section on the planet. Eddie, Eddie has the ability to be perfect every night. He does the same thing. I am not that perfect. You know, I'm kind of more jazzy. Like I have good nights, I have better nights than other nights. But Eddie, I can rely on Eddie 100%. So I rely on these guys between the lines. That's what that's what uh, sports guys always say, you know, between the lines. You know, when you get between the lines in a, on your field, can you rely on your people on the field? And I always can rely on D. I always rely on Mark, always rely on Eddie. Always rely on AJ, and of course, to have Portnoy come in after AJ's death, and for Portnoy to be as great as Portnoy was, and as unassuming as Portnoy was, not doing anything to take away the shadow of AJ Pirro, but to play AJ's parts just the way AJ played. And I even said to Mike, I said to Mike, we want you to be Mike. He goes, no, I'm not going to be Mike Portnoy. Not in this case. I thought that was great because I thought he's going to be too showy and he's not going to respect, but he did. And it, and it really was great for the fans. Um, AJ is one of the most underrated drummers there is. We, it, it, we brought out so many drummers to play with Sin City Sinners. When we brought AJ, we knew we liked Twisted Sister. He, we had to get him the Iron Cobra double bass pedal. And we watched him play these songs. He would have played all night. He would have played for two hours. He loved to play. And man, was he amazing. Yeah. And uh, such a tragic loss because he was also such an incredible uh, person. I loved him. He was like a baby brother to me. And we had this we had this conversation. He called me Mr. French and I called him Mr. Pirro. And I have to tell you that every year we'd get together for the summer festivals and we'd always do a pre-prep rehearsal in March or April in Long Island. And when we walked in the rehearsal room, and everybody finally was tuned up and ready to go. We always use the same song. Shoot him down was our first song. And every year I look at him and go, Mr. Pirro and Mr. French. And he'd count off. And his pocket was so perfect. You know, he was as important to this band as John Bonham was to, to Zeppelin. Uh -huh. And Keith Moon is to the Who. It doesn't mean you can't bring other people in. But there was a specialty there. And, of course, to have Portnoy come in with his monumental technical skills. Uh, and his professionalism, which was extraordinary. You know, Mark, Mike Portnoy has played in every band that's ever existed. Like the joke with Mike, you know, who haven't you played with? You know, when I introduced him on stage, I said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the drummer for the Beatles Stones. Who's that? Floyd, Grateful Dead, Jazz, Joplin, Mer Jefferson Airplane, Pearl Jam, Metallica. And he, and he laughs. I don't know how he keeps his head together. I don't know how he keeps these songs in this Rolodex brain, you know, but he is amazing. So all these guys are amazing, and and you have to rely on the people you're with. And in the book, we describe you know how much you have to have that same feeling, of of uh, of excellence. You know, you have to have that same. You have to strive for the same goals, and the guys in Twisted all had the same goals. So I got to ask the question. It's the most obvious question, and then we're going to promote some stuff, not just the book. You got a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. The obvious question you've kind of already answered it is: Do you think we'll ever see Twisted Sister uh, live again? I. I I said no back when it was really no, and we did. Like back when we weren't getting along. Right. And look what we did. We came back. I'm not going to say no because I think people saying no is stupid. However, here's the best way to answer it. We all got together for dinner last year, and we never brought up the subject once. So what does that tell you? The subject was never even mentioned. All was all we talked about was whose kids were doing what, who's getting married, who's having kids. You know, just dads and you know wives were with us, and that was it. So, um, uh, no one has called anybody up and said, "Do you want to do this again?" No one. I haven't made that call. No one's made that call to me. D hasn't made that call. Eddie hasn't made that call. No one's made that call. So until that call gets made. Um, I would say that it, it's not going to happen. All right, let's call these guys, JJ. Come on, I got my phone. Let's, let's get a conference. No, but uh, you know, people ask me all the time, do I talk to these guys? Today, I talked to Mark, Eddie, and D. Yeah, it's great. I talked well, to all three, talked it's to all three of them today. It's amazing that you've been able to keep that. Let me tell you, not just as a fan, why I think the world still needs Twisted Sister. Because younger people are discovering this band. And you know what? We named some of the bands that just aren't as good as they were 
and Twisted Sister is and can be. And I know AJ's loss is huge. I, I, I really do. It's a, even though the four guys up front are still there, it, it's changed. But I, it's funny how many young people I meet who are discovering music through YouTube and Spotify and the, and the car commercials and whatever else, else that you've sold. And I think these people, they have no idea what a great band Twisted Sister is. I know you can see the videos and things, but I feel like one day the pressure is going to be so much you know, uh, you know, God willing or whatever, you guys are all still uh, alive and active, you know, and I feel like Pete, the pressure is going to come at some point where people want to see Twisted Sister. Yeah, again. But you know what? The the pressure came to Pink Floyd and the Zeppelin and they didn't mm -hmm. take they didn't do it either. They did a couple of things. Charity gigs. Right. But they said, you know, let's leave it. Let's just leave it, you know, and and, and I can leave it. So if I never did it again, I'm okay. The right, last let me show, throw, let me throw one more point at you. Yeah. The last show was in uh, Mexico. Yes. Shouldn't the last Twisted Sisters show be in uh, New York? Um, You're going to give me a business answer. <laughs> the, well, um, that would have been a, a conversation to have in 2016. Right. Okay, so it didn't. And that last run was extraordinary. That last summer, the crowds averaged 60,000 and up to 110,000 twice around Europe. And I've got, you know, we've filmed most of it and it's just sitting in a can right now because my label doesn't release DVDs anymore. And, I don't, you know, and besides which there's publishing issues, there's a lot of issues involved but we have a record coming out we have a best of live and studio album coming out in november on colored vinyl because vinyl's so big and uh, and it's the greatest hits album is, is the studio side on, and the live side is just the best songs from marquee the best songs from hammersmith and the best songs from the astoria on vinyl because people are buying vinyl again um yes. but having said it um you know when we walked off stage on the 16th uh, on the sixth rather on, on november 16th we had a very emotional meeting in the dressing room. It was very emotional. I, I, I started to break down. And because all summer, my wife said, are you going to miss it? I went, nah, I'm not going to miss it. Nah, I'm not going to miss it. Nah, I'm not going to miss it. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. And every night, we would count down the 17 songs, and there was another night gone. That last night was very emotional. And maybe one day, the, the, the dressing room clip will come out. You know what we said to each other in the dressing room but i thank the crew i love the crew they were great and then when we got to the end at the very very end of mexico and we and we bowed and i said john this really is the end you know this is the end i can tell you that in 88 when it ended i dreamed about the reunion mm -hmm. for years I have never dreamed about the reunion yes. because we came back at a level that was respectfully commensurate with where the band should have been. Major headliners in 30 countries where we got all the love. And big okay. guarantees, too, that you yeah, deserve. I'm not going to say no, but yes. Yeah. And we played with Metallica and we played with Iron Maiden and we played with all of them. And whether we blew them off the stage or not, I'm not going to get into a Twitter war or a, bla or, or a blabbermouth war. But well, we that's got a book to sell, though. <laughs> that, that, that's up for the fans to decide. Right. But you know what? Let me, let me say this. I don't care if we got blown, if you blow us away. If you blew us away, then you made the night better for the fans. So, so our attitude is you go out there as a war and your idea is to win the war. If you win the war, that means you put on a phenomenal show for your fans. I don't root for another band not to do well. When bands aren't as good as us, I kind of shake my head and go, why do they bother getting up? But that's their, that's their business to do it. I root for bands to be great. I would sit there going, blow us away. You're so great. Blow us off. The go ahead, man. Take your best shot. You know, we're a bunch of 60-year-old guys. You can easily take us out. You're younger than us. You're better. It never happened, in my opinion. So... Um, I looked at it as a blood sport. You know, the Twisted Sister did not take love onto the stage when it came to creating an image for the band and our belief that we could control a night. But that's what we would do. We would control a night and we'd want to win that night. Uh, but if someone managed to blow us away, have at it. You know, if you're better than us, 
great. I never sit there and go, oh, man, I would go fine. That means that the fans would get a better show. I have zero tolerance for lack of professionalism, zero tolerance for bands to show up late, zero tolerance to treat their bands like crap. I don't like it. I don't care how hip you think it is. And I will not mention names of famous bands that fuck their fans all the time. and The fans eat that. We were disciplined in the bars. You show up at 9.45 to play, you play at 9.45. Contract says you're on at 10, you're on at 10. Contract you get your says truck blown up. You know, sorry? You'll get your truck blown up if you don't <laughs> yeah. follow the rules. Yeah, you, should, yeah you, you do what you say you're going to do. We had enormous pride in delivering the goods. Man, if we were five minutes late, I'd be pissed. Mm -hmm. Five minutes late would annoy me. Like, how come we're five minutes late? It better be someone else's fault. It better be because their crew or the other band didn't have, you know what I mean, took a long time to break down their stage. Because people don't understand how hard it is to turn a stage over in front of 100,000 people in 45 minutes. You know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. In, in these massive festivals where they're putting on, you know, Ozzy and, and Whitesnake and Def and all these bands are coming on. And, you know, in between each band is 45 minutes and they're altering the stages. You know the pressure on the crew to be perfect. And then once the intro tape starts, the war starts. Right. You know, the minute, the minute um, Long Way to the Top is played, you know for the next two hours... The war is on. The war is on. I have never had that, that tape started and stop, ever. Once the tape rolls, the war is on. And we will do whatever we have to do to win that war. But we do it so the fans walk away happy. And the promoters, think about this. How many bands exist on this planet where a promoter trusts a band with 100,000 people? Not that many bands. No. Okay? Not at all. There's a handful of bands that are trusted with 100,000 people. Iron Maiden, ACDC, Kiss, Judas Priest, Sabbath, Guns N' Roses, Twisted Sister, maybe another three or four. That a promoter knows that when you go on stage and there's 100,000 people standing out there, they're going to walk away going, that was an amazing show. So for all of those bands I just mentioned, hats off to them for the professionalism that they exhibit to be trusted with a fan base that big to make a promoter happy. And people do not think in those terms. You know, they don't think in those terms. You know, they don't know what it's like when you're on stage and you're standing there in front of 100,000 people. And as the manager of the band, right. the song starts. And you know what I'm thinking? I'm just looking. The first four minutes of a Twisted show, I'm watching every lighting rig, every monitor, all the flash pots, and I just want to get through the first song with nobody dying, you know? So if the first song goes by and everything is okay and the monitors are fine, D can hear himself, everyone's standing on their spot, the spot's lights are hitting the right people at the right time, and the flash pots are going off and, and, no, and everyone's in the right position, at that point, I'm like this. Whew. And I can enjoy myself. But yeah, until, you can do what you do, yeah. yeah. But until that three or four minutes goes by, all I'm doing is on stage going off a checklist. Um, yeah, I, I can imagine. We're, we're talking about, you know, reunion. The, the whole thing is there's nothing left to prove. If something happens or there's a cause last time, it was, 20, you know, 20 years ago or 18, 9, 11. Still, 20 years ago, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you guys raised a lot of money for uh, first responders, families. And so who knows? Maybe one day there's a cause or there's a purpose or there's a reason. But for right now, there really is nothing for Twisted Sister to prove. It would be great to see some of that footage if it, if it can come out. Yeah, I, I just look, these out there as a solo artist, I wish them all the best as a solo artist. And Eddie on his projects and Mark, whatever Mark does. And me, I, you know, I'm an author now and a, and a speaker and I'm enjoying that on a one to one basis. And and uh, that's what makes me happy right now. Well, let's talk about that, JJ, real quick before I let you go. Let's do some business, mm -hmm. some twisted business. This is the French Connection. This is your podcast. And uh, it's a perfect time for podcasts. People are looking for things to listen to. You have great insight. This is not just, uh, you know, uh, Twisted Sister. This is other people, other conversations. You write a column for Goldmine Magazine, I believe, right? Yeah. And a it's beetle, a, 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 beetle, a Beetle column called Now We're 64. Yeah, about the Beatles, which is great. I mean, I I, and I read some of the uh, the later um, articles. And so you tell stories. The story you tell about going to the Dakota the night that John Lennon died is, is moving. My family and I went to a restaurant right around the corner 
you know, I was younger, but this was one of the most tragic days in history. And so the way you tell those stories and just you write about it. I love that you took on talking about Strawberry Fields and the guitar players who play there. Nobody would think of, they're always there. There's always someone playing, but what's the story behind these people? And you took that on. And I think it's makes, it made for such a great article and a respectful article. I know you said, I don't want to write another sad story and certainly don't want to write something about a horrible person, you know, a, a murderer. And so the things that you put into your articles and that you put into this book, I think are great for the podcast. So tell people where they can find it. So uh, it's called The French Connection Beyond the Music. It's available um, through Podcast One, Apple Tunes, and Spotify. And uh, I have, I have, like Rob Halford and you know Nuno Bentoncourt and Joe Bonamassa, you know, guy Joel Hookstra, guys like that. I've got authors of books that I really find fa fascinating. Jonathan Taplin has written a bestseller. You know, he was the producer of The Last Waltz, one of my favorite movies. Um, uh, I've had Don McLean, who did American Pie. I had a great, I had a blast with Don McLean because, you know, Don McLean's sick of trying to explain American Pie. And I said to Don, I don't, I don't need to explain American Pie. I know it. I want to know exactly what you were thinking when you wrote the damn song. I mean, tell me th how you wrote it. That's what I want to know. Where did you sit down and write? And he, people didn't ask him those questions. They just want to know what the meaning was. I said, ah, that's old school already. I want to know as an artist what made you think of it. And he told me the whole story. And at the beginning of it, I was told, you know, he's a shy guy, blah, blah, blah. blah. By the end of it, I, I said, would you sing a, 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 a chorus for me? And he picked up his guitar and he did, which he doesn't do for people, right? Mm -hmm. So he felt comfortable because he knew that I knew that I understood what he was trying to do. Anyway, stuff like that. Rob Halford's was amazing because Rob Halford and I, had mirror images of our own image. Rob Halford was afraid that if the world found out he was gay, it would destroy his career and that of Judas Priest. And I was feared that if people found out how straight Twisted Sister was, it would destroy our career. And I thought, how ironic is that? You know, how ironic. And Rob, Rob was like, that's pretty weird. <laughs> you know, that's, that's weird because we were the straightest band in the world, you know, and we were warned, don't tell people how straight you are. Don't tell them, you know, drug addicts. Don't tell them, you don't do drugs. That'll fuck up your career. So that's odd. Okay. I've had actresses on. I've had authors on. Um, this week, um, Steve Farber, my co-writer, is on. But next week, I got George Binder, who produced two of my favorite all-time shows, The Tammy Show and The Elvis Comeback Special. And if you haven't watched The Tammy Show or don't know what The Tammy Show is, the Tammy Show is one of the greatest rock concerts ever filmed in the history of mankind. It was filmed in 1964. On that bill was Chuck Berry, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, Leslie Gore, the Supremes, the Beach Boys, Jan and Dean, um, Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson, James Brown, and the Rolling Stones. That's in sad. one afternoon. In one afternoon. Okay, in an auditorium in, in 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 Santa Monica, California. You want to see a show that'll blow your mind? Watch the Tammy Show. It stands for Teenage Music International, which is like a dumb title. But go online, hit James Brown, the Tammy Show, and watch. Sit back and watch the single greatest performance by a singer in the history of all histories. The single greatest performance you're ever going to see. I told this to D. D tweeted me or wrote me last week. He said, dude, I saw the Tammy show. You're hundred percent right. James Brown is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Mick Jagger's quote, biggest mistake Rolling Stones ever made following James Brown on the Tammy show. Okay. Keith Richards, biggest mistake Rolling Stones ever made following James Brown on the Tammy show. So that's number one. Number two, Elvis comeback special, 1968. Anyway, the bottom line is the guy I'm interviewing next week is the guy who produced and directed both. Which you must be yeah. so excited for because you must have a million questions. You've been watching million. this thing your whole life. Whole, my, my whole life. Are you kidding? I had Jonathan Taplin on who hired Scorsese to direct The Last Waltz, right? And I thought, well, that's one of the three of the greatest things I've ever seen. You know, I'm never going to meet the people behind The Tammy Show and Elvis, so forget that. I'm never going to meet them. However, I was at a wedding this past summer. I was at a wedding, minding my own business, sitting on a lawn after the wedding was over the next day at the bride's parents' house, just minding my own business. And a guy walks up to me, and he, and he was a lawyer, a friend of the groom's family or whatever. And he says, and he starts this conversation with me, you know, what's the best group you ever saw? Because people ask me this because I'm so old, and I'm like Yoda, you know, so I must have seen everybody, which I have. And I'm going, saying to myself, oh, man, what am I going to say to this guy? I'm going to talk to him about seeing Zepp as an opening act or the grateful. And I went, listen, he, all you got to do is this. 
get the last waltz this thing called the tammy show that you never heard of in the elvis comeback special watch him probably the greatest thing you're ever going to see that's what i tell him and he goes the tammy show and the elvis comeback special i said yeah tammy show i'm not even going to tell you what it means it's because you're not going to remember and he goes um my wife's father is the director and the producer of those two shows and i went what what are you talking about and he calls his wife over and he goes dana this is jj john french blah, blah, blah. tell him about your father she goes oh my father's name is steve binder he produced all these famous shows including the tammy show and the elvis coming i went what so i said well it's too bad i couldn't interview him he's probably dead she goes not as far as i know he's not dead she pulls out her phone she calls him mm -hmm. i'm sitting on a chair a lawn chair do you understand this <laughs> the guy gets on the phone steve binder yeah he goes hi uh uh i'm i'm uh, I'm like Ralph Cramden in the honeymooners. Like, how am I, how am I, how am I, how am I? Anyway, he's on my show. He's on my podcast. And his brain, he's 89 years old. Wow. And the stories he tells about that show, the Tammy show, and the stories that he tells about Elvis are amazing. And you know what? I love this stuff. So that's what I love about my podcast. Well, that's what it's going to make you so great at the podcast and for people to listen to because you're passionate. This is not something you're doing because you've got to pay the bills. You care about the people you're talking to. Uh, and there's so many people who do these in their basement and they say you were in Twisted Sister. What was that like? You know, and that's not a very exciting interview. This week I've spoke to Carmine Apice, Susie Quattro, and now JJ French. And it the, the variety of people, if you're interested in them and you research them and they have something to promote, makes for a great show. So we got to make sure that people uh, tune into the French Connection. It's easy to find anywhere podcasts are available. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for promoting that so much. Right. And the book, of course, Twisted Business, it comes out on the on uh, the 21st of this month, and I'll be doing in stores in New York and in L.A. Yeah, and this. all those dates are online. You can Nowadays, it's easy to get information, but we'll put it in the description. You yeah. can buy the book right now. It's in the yeah. description. Uh, and it's available everywhere September 21st. We want to make sure you get it. JJ, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me. I'm going to be tasting hot sauce with uh, Eddie on Wednesday. So <laughs> totally good. I will be seeing Eddie in Nashville in two weeks. So I haven't seen Eddie in a long time. So I look forward to seeing him. So give him my best, even though we texted about two hours, <laughs> about two hours ago. Absolutely. Thank All you right. so much. And, uh, and, and what a great book. I really do recommend people read it. Thank you. I much appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Take care.